Welcome to the 45th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with author and editor, James Lauder. Well, this is uh, Jeffrey Deaver, author of uh, most recently The Burning Wire and uh, soon to be author of the next continuation James Bond novel. I spend a lot of time writing, a lot of time researching my books, um, but uh, when I'm not doing that, I, I love uh, listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast, which you can hear at readingandwritingpodcast.com. Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is James Lauder, novelist, short story writer, media tie-in writer, and editor. Lauder's latest anthology that he edited, Curse of the Full Moon, is available in trade paperback now. James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Sure, sure. Well, I just mentioned The Curse of the Full Moon. This is an anthology of werewolf stories featuring many well-known authors, including Ramsey Campbell, Joe Lansdale, who I also interviewed on this podcast in a previous episode, um, Harlan Ellison, Charles DeLint, and the list goes on and on. I, I'm, I'm curious, why do you think the werewolf legend continues to intrigue readers and, and what's the appeal? Well, the werewolves are one of the, the major monster archetypes. And I think as just as a, a, a subject, they get uh, they, they speak to uh, the idea of control and anger and identity. And because of the shape shifting aspect of it, ca characters, stories about characters that seem to be one thing and change into something else or hide their identity and then it's revealed under the full moon, uh, have an appeal and, and provide writers with a lot of, of interesting opportunities for story and character development. Uh, and they also speak to the idea that uh, you know, everybody has, uh, you know, vampires deal with sexuality and uh, a lot of the vampire stories will at one point or another, get down to that, uh, get down to that theme. Werewolf stories very often deal with people's ability or inability to deal with anger. Sure. And I think that's another one of the reasons why they're they're appealing just as a general topic. Interesting. Um, I, I'm I, I'm also curious for for those people who may be listening and who may not have a lot of um, knowledge or insight into how publishing works kind of behind the scenes. I wondered if you can talk a little bit about the process of, of putting together an anthology like Curse of the Full Moon, uh, like some of the basic mechanics of the process. D did you have writers on board before you sold the anthology? Do you sell it to an editor based on kind of the idea and then you go out and find stories that you think would be appropriate? How, how does that work? Well, it, it does happen a lot of different ways. One of the ways that anthologies get sold or you you'll have two or three key writers uh involved in the project and then you'll find a publisher or an editor or a publisher uh who you can pitch the idea to uh, curse of the full moon came about uh kind of a, an, an odd way originally ulysses uh, had contacted me about editing a zombie anthology for them in late 2008 and it turned out that actually didn't work out scheduling and a lot of other things came up and I ended up not doing that. And they had contacted me because I'd edited three werewolf, uh, three, uh, zombie anthologies before for right. Eden studios. Mm -hmm. And while we were talking about the zombie anthology, I had mentioned that no one had really done a werewolf anthology in a while. Uh, the last major one had been, uh, a Stephen Jones book. Mm -hmm. And that had been, that had been a number of years, uh, in the past. Sure. And if they were interested in the topic, then that would be something I think we would be able to line up some great stories. And I listed four or five stories that I, I thought would be available and authors I would be able to speak with pretty quickly about it. Um, after the zombie anthology didn't work, they later came back to me and said, well, how about we do the werewolf idea? And then from there, I set about actually collecting up all of the authors. I didn't have anybody specifically lined up at the time I pitched it, though there were people I wanted to get involved. Right, right. Uh, great. Um, and I should add, not to be too self-promotional, but I also did an interview with Stephen Jones as well. So if someone's interested, they can check that out. Um, yes, and Steve, Stephen's a fantastic editor. So. Yeah, yeah. He, he's done, he's done uh, amazing amount of anthologies and, and um, 
Great. Well, um, when you started publishing, when you started publishing fiction originally, you you published media tie-in novels for Dungeons and Dragons, and and I wonder what um, uh, how that kind of came about. Were were you interested in writing fiction uh, before those novels, or was that kind of the first fiction that you uh, that you ended up writing, and then kind of going from there? What what was kind of your background in terms of writing and interest in writing and your path to publication? Well, I had been involved in writing since I was in uh, in high school and had been pretty active in college uh, at Marquette University. I had been uh, on an editor on the literary magazine and had published a, a story and a, a couple of poems while I was at, uh, at college. I got a job at TSR, which was the publisher of Dungeons and Dragons at the time, in their fiction department as an editor. And it was because of my background. I, I had a kind of a split background. I understood the gaming material, but I was also I had a degree in in literature, and I, I was involved with editing and writing before that. And so that was how I landed sort of in the book division there. And from there, I had I uh, I got the opportunity to pitch some uh, material to them as a writer. Uh, I came in interested in doing that, and so when the opportunity arose, I, I jumped at it. Uh, the interesting part about uh, the initial things that I that I sold to TSR as a writer mm -hmm. was that they had to be submitted blind. Uh, <laughs> they, we had a blind audition process in the book department at the time. And uh, so all of the things that were coming in from out of house and all of the submissions that anybody connected to the company was was putting together were putting together all had to go in with nobody's name on them and the editors who were reviewing them. Uh, didn't know anybody's, uh, you know, who in particular was uh, was submitting. Right. So it was just based on here's the plot outline I would I would do, and here's a chapter or two, and and the best person for the book would win. And uh, so that was how actually I got my first two assignments that way um, was was through that audition process, and eventually I got. Um, I, I lined up some other things too, but I'd also started publishing outside of TSR. Right. Uh, and, uh, well, that's, that's a great endorsement for your writing. <laughs> I, I was in a way it was, it was tough to do at the time. I was, I was, uh, I, it was a hard thing to think, well, why, why are we taking all of the names off of this? But then once <laughs> I understood what the process was, you don't want that sort of nepotism to creep into the process. You want people to be assigned books because their writing fits what the editor thinks is the best for the project. Gotcha. And, and so I was very happy in the long run with, with actually having to go through those flaming hoops at the time to, to get published <laughs> because it did make me feel like I actually had earned the spots by my, from my writing, not just because I knew people at the company. Right. Right. And so, and were, so you, were you, were you there during the whole dragon Lance, um, I guess, uh, phenomenon, I guess you could I, say, or I, I was, and I started right after the first six books, the last of the six books had been published and they were doing the first of the books after that. And I, I this was around 88, 89 was when mm -hmm. I started and I was in house at TSR for four years and was there at pretty much at the launch of the Forgotten Realms. There was one book, maybe two Forgotten Realms books out at the point at which I started. And I edited those, edited a lot of the Forgotten Realms novels, edited a lot of the Ravenloft and Dark Sun novels when they first came out. And they, they did incredibly well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, it, was incre it really was amazing to see how well those books sold and how much the, the audience just loved them. And it was a great way to learn the, pro uh, the process. It was a very small department. We had three or four people in-house and we did everything. We wrote back cover copy. We wrote advertising copy. We did art orders. We did all of the promotion. Um, the company was expanding after, after in the early '90s. The company started to expand, and more people came in to do some of those. But mm -hmm. when I started, that was that everybody who worked in the department uh, had a hand in doing all of those things, and it was a great way to learn. Uh, I learned some typesetting stuff. I learned all <laughs> kinds of, of different things to to. Uh, to put the books together. And that served me really well in the year since then, because I've held all kinds of different jobs uh, mm -hmm. for different publishers and being able to, being able to look at a book and say, all right, well, I've done everything from filing for an ISBN number to typesetting <laughs> this. Um, 
and getting it into the into the system and writing the ad copy uh, helps me to understand the process and and uh, put together books that are strong in a lot of ways that some editors may not be able to because they haven't had that opportunity. Sure, sure. So do you still do you still play uh, role playing games today? I. I actually don't have a lot of time to play role-playing games. I did play in high school. I, I started playing D and D in the late seventies, mm -hmm. uh, but I've I, I play more board games and things like that now. Uh, I edited uh, a couple of books: uh, Hobby Games the Hundred Best and Family Games the Hundred Best, which had a uh, hundred different game designers mm -hmm. uh, writing about what they considered the best board games and role-playing games and card games, but it couldn't be anything they had ever worked on or their, or their company published. Uh, and that was, that again, tapped into that other part of my background. I, I understand the gaming stuff pretty well. Mm -hmm. Um, and I play, but I, I do get together with friends and my family and, and we play a lot of board games and card games, not, not so much role-playing games these days. Sure. I, I'm curious if you've kind of watched the industry from afar and what your thoughts are. I mean, obviously with, um, you know, TSR's kind of uh, various changes and evolution over the years. And, um, and, and while I don't play regularly, I, I've, I've noticed there's, there's now, I think the name of the game is Pathfinder, which is really um, oh, becoming yes. popular. I was just curious what your, what your, what your thinking is of the industry. Well, I, I've been involved sort of in a weird place in, in, the hobby game industry since my uh, I left TSR in, in 92 full-time. I've been freelancing full-time since since 92. And I've worked with a number of game publishers on fiction projects, most of them not directly tied to games. So mm -hmm. the, Eden, the Eden Studio zombie uh, anthologies, for example, were just creator-owned zombie stories. It, it was marketed in relation to a, a a role-playing game, but really it wasn't a role-playing game product. Right. Um, so I've been involved as I'm kind of the fiction guy. I do all of these projects for, for game publishers when they want to try doing especially creator own fiction. Right. Um, it's been the Pathfinder Paizo and, and the Pathfinder folks are, are fantastic and they do, uh, they do great work. They love what they're doing. They have a really good, clear, direct relationship with their fans and that's helped them grow as quickly as they have. Uh, it's been interesting to see the Pathfinder stuff rivaling D and D in terms of sales. That's that's really kind of a, a surprise. Um, but uh, Wizards of the Coast is is at a disadvantage being part of Hasbro because it's sure. such a big company, and they're such a small part of such a big company that it's harder for them to move quickly, and the expectations for them to succeed are very different than what they are for a lot of the other game companies. Uh, right. But there's a number of people are doing just great, uh, great work. Uh, Green Ronin is, is done. Uh, Guys, do you want to lose weight fast? Have more energy and improve your health? Now you can with Nutrisystem for men. Get delicious breakfasts, lunches, and dinners, even snacks and shakes delivered right to your door. All delivered for free. It's easy to follow and you'll see results in your first week. Go to Nutrisystem.com slash meal now and get 50% off everything. And with their new premium meals, guys get bigger, bolder meals with up to 30 grams of protein and 25% more calories to keep you feeling fresh full and satisfied as you drop the pounds. Just go to Nutrisystem.com slash meal right now and get 50% off. You heard me right. Go to Nutrisystem.com slash meal right now and get 50% off everything. Forget about takeout and fast food. Nutrisystem for men is real food and real simple. It's all planned out and delivered right to your front door. Don't wait. This special offer will not last forever. Just go to Nutrisystem.com slash meal right now and get 50% off. Go to Nutrisystem.com slash meal. Deal. The uh, they're doing the Game of Thrones role playing game. They're also right. doing Dragon Age, which is a great starter game. Um, you know, Eden is still doing card games and, and things like that. Uh, places like Fantasy Flight, uh, doing top notch board games. Uh, part of this is is got to do with the growth of of uh, technology, because there are things that these companies can do with three or four people sometimes that would take thirty people to do back when I started at TSR, they were still doing covers by using light tables and big cameras and everything now is done on Quark or PageMaker or, you know, whatever, pick your program. 
Right. Um, and that's uh, that's changed the industry quite a lot. It's raised the bar for a lot of for what a lot of these places can do. That, that, that's interesting. It kind of leads into the next question that I had, had jotted down. Um, what, what do you think? And I think you may have just answered some of it. What, what do you think in terms of the impact of, of um, ebooks and technology, not just with uh, role playing games, but also with kind of media tie in fiction and, 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 and that type of uh, fiction and. Well, media tie in, I mean, any kind of tie in, any kind of licensed, especially fiction is always a perilous sort of project because you are so at the whim of the people who control the license. And there are times when you can get enlightened editors and you can get enlightened IP owners and they can set up the conditions by which you can create interesting things with a license. The one, one of the great parts about working on uh, the early TSR novels was the books were largely up to the authors to drive. There were not a lot of times when, uh, especially when we were around 88 to 92, when I was there, we were setting up conditions for whole series where we wanted people to come in, pitch original characters, pick a spot on a map that nobody had explored. And to basically pitch a good idea that you wanted to tell in your own voice and make this part of the world your own and develop it. And that's great. That, that, allows as close to a creator owned circumstances as is possible with a license. Um, at the, on the other hand, there are plenty of licenses where you will hit the wall every time you try to turn around and you're being told, well, you can't do this or there's a movie coming out and now we have to change everything. And, and they can be very, very, uh, very, very perilous projects for, for creators. Um, I don't think that's going to change so much because of the ebook situation. The ebook situation is going to change maybe how often some of the licensors think they want to try fiction. Mm-hmm. Because you think, right, you think they'll be more more prone since this. You I know, think they will. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. because you're not the publishers, and if you're an IP uh, owner, and mm-hmm. you know, Fred the Barbarian, you want to suddenly try to do fiction. Uh, you don't have to actually worry about printing and distribution if you just want to go through Amazon. Exactly. You really only then have to worry about getting the book together. Now, part of the problem with that is the the ease with which books can be put together in electronic format often means that people don't understand how important it is for things to be edited and to have other people looking at the material to serve as gatekeepers. Sure. And one of the reasons why those early, and this goes back to what we, we talked about a little earlier with my first, uh, the, the first pitches I put together for book projects, those books were better for having for for me having to go through that process by which I actually had to pitch the outline and the the uh, writing sample and I learned a lot from from those because the editors came back and said okay this is good but here's where you need to strengthen your plot and here's where you need to work on characterization more uh, and things like that that doesn't happen with a lot of ebooks and especially sure. the people who are doing self publishing a good editor is very important for for anybody. And that gets lost in in the ease with which the ebooks get published. Sure, sure, agreed with that. Um, you just mentioned earlier that you've been freelancing since 1992. Uh, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk about maybe some things that you've learned along the way in terms of your managing your own time and projects, and and you know what your if you could give us kind of an idea of what your writing schedule is like. Um, I, I, I wish I'd learned more about manning, managing <laughs> my time and, and my projects. Uh, like most freelancers, I've always got about eight things going on. If you're doing it full time, you've always got about eight things going on at the same time. And you know, right now I'm editing two anthologies and I'm editing the hack slash comic book for image and working on a couple of my own short stories. And I've got a novel project going and there's all these other things. I, Really, if you want to succeed at that, you've got to get good at being able to bear down on your schedule when you need to, to keep track of when things are due and and prioritize. Um, if you're doing the, the one thing that I've found, and I'm still working on this, is if you're kind of wearing both hats with the writer and editor, it's difficult. It actually becomes very difficult to do both well. 
And that's something I would like to get back to do more writing myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's easier for me to line up work as an editor. Uh, so it's, it, it's a, it's kind of a quandary. Um, the one thing that I learned actually not long after I left TSR it took me a couple of years, but the most important thing I ever learned was to say no, that as a, as a freelancer, you're always going to feel like you shouldn't be turning down work because you never know when the work is going to come up again. And I, a couple of years in, I somebody had offered me a project that I, I just didn't like the way the contract worked and, and things like that, and I said no. And from that time, I've actually been able to line up better projects because I had a clear idea of what my priorities were. So, so saying no is, is, not a, is not a bad thing for a freelancer. You don't want to take on projects that you're doing just to do a project or just because of the money. You've got to keep that in mind. You're a, you're a business person. But you, you do need to be able to say no. Great. Well, um, do you have specific uh, writing tips or, or thoughts for someone who may be listening who is trying to break into publishing? Anything that you that you would offer as, as um, advice for an aspiring writer? Uh, read as much as possible, and and read more than just, especially if you're interested in genre writing. A lot of the work I do is in horror and and fantasy and and things like that, but. The most interesting things uh, that have been come that that uh, that you'll see as a as a writer and even as an editor when somebody pitches you a story, there see when I do say that werewolf anthology and somebody's pitching me a new story, if all the people have if all the writer has read are other werewolf stories, it's going to be derivative. Mm -hmm. If they've read a lot of mysteries and they've read a lot of, of uh, you know, slipstream stuff and they've read all kinds of war novels and everything else, it's going to give you the ability to bring something new to whatever topic you approach. So so read as widely as possible uh, and read as critically as possible. Make notes of, of even when you're reading a, a nonfiction book of the things, the facts, the details, the way a sentence is put together that you think is makes for interesting reading what captured you. Uh, the, uh, the other thing, and this applies to, to everybody writing is write for yourself. And that way, even if you don't sell it, you've still got something that you value. It's you, you, if you chase the market and you write things, and this goes along, I guess, with saying no to things. Mm -hmm. If you chase the market and you write things that you're writing because you think you can sell them, it soon becomes a pretty passionless pursuit. Uh, you know, writing rarely pays anybody uh, enough money to uh, <laughs> to <laughs> to do it for a long time if you don't really care about what you're doing. Sure. Do you do you have some favorite writers or writers that you've been reading lately that you really enjoy? Uh, oh, I, there's a number of people. I, I Michael Moorcock, I'll read whatever he he <laughs> uh, releases. China Mieville, um, mm -hmm. I, his stuff is fantastic. I when we were talking a little bit ago about the uh, the cross genre stuff, that's one of the reasons that Moorcock appeals to me because he brings in. The, the literary and the genre and everything else. Sure. Uh, same thing with like Cornell Woolrich, uh, the the mystery writer. Mm -hmm. uh, Night Has a Thousand Eyes is a fantastic horror novel. <laughs> it's <laughs> it, it's you know marketed as a mystery and and uh, that's the way a lot of people would think of Woolrich's stuff, but it actually is a, a really existential horror novel. Um, uh, Pynchon and uh, Hunter Thompson, and uh, I, I read a, a lot of nonfiction about the history of rock and roll and all kinds of other things like that. Um, That's great. So, what what are you working on now? Do you do you um, have anything coming up that you'd like to to mention? Well, the 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 biggest project I've got going on right now is uh, a book, uh, an essay anthology called Triumph of the Walking Dead, which is going to be released by Ben Bella in their Smart Pop line. And it's a collection of essays about the comics and the TV show. And this is, goes back to the zombie stuff. No matter sure. 
how far I seem to get from doing zombie stuff, I always end up coming back <laughs> to it for, for some reason. I've done this is four or five books now, um, and that's got a, a number of of great people: Jonathan Mayberry and and uh, uh, Jay Bonansinga and and uh, different critics and zombie people uh, who, who write a lot about zombie stuff. Uh, Joe Lansdale's doing the forward for it. Um, and that's coming out in o- late October, November, around the time the uh, the uh, second season of the show launches. Um, I'm doing another Shapeshifter anthology for Eden Studios uh, Great. called Strange Faces. And that's going to be mostly leaning toward the non-werewolf stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's got uh, Dean Koontz and... and uh, Kids Johnson and Robert Silverberg, you know, some of the other people that, that were in Curse of the Full Moon, Le Guin and Campbell and, and DeLint, uh, other people like that, um, working on a couple of short stories and uh, a comic book script and, you know, editing, as I mentioned earlier, editing the Hackslash series for uh, for uh, Tim Seeley over at Image, which is a lot of fun. I, I love comics, too. I've been – and that's – really the, the, the main part about my career that right now I feel incredibly lucky. I was a gamer, hobbyist gamer, uh, got to work at, 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 uh, TSR for a number of years and work on Dungeons and Dragons and do some role-playing stuff. I have been a, a fan of comics as a medium since I was a kid and I'm getting mm-hmm. to do some stuff in comics. Um, you know, the, the people in Curse of the Full Moon, if you read that, Tape, the Table of Contents and Curse of the Full Moon, that was actually a very easy book for me to put together because I looked at my own bookshelf and said, you know, you would ask me a little while ago about, you know, what authors do I read? Well, Curse of the Full Moon. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> those, those are the authors I read uh, in in large part. those A lot of those people are, you know, Neil Gaiman and and the, the, the people that, that I managed to line up, George Martin, uh, are the people who I, those are the books on my shelf. Great. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm actually very busy. I feel very lucky that, uh, that I'm getting to work on the sorts of projects that I do. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with James Lauder, his latest anthology, Curse of the Full Moon, uh, werewolf anthology is available in bookstores now. Thanks for taking the time to do the interview, James. Thanks very much. Sure. This is Lee Child, and I'm listening to the Reading and Writing Podcast. Thanks for listening to my latest podcast. If you have a chance, please leave a review of the podcast in iTunes. It only takes a moment. Until next time, read some good books and be well. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now get any breakfast sandwich for just two bucks. Available only through the app. Mobile order and pay available at participating McDonald's. McD app download and registration required. What's the room again? Uh, 1240, down at the end. Ooh, what's that? Sammy, don't touch that. That's someone's old food. Here we are. Do you have the key? You have both of ours. Oh, right. Not working. Uh, Rub it. Come uh, on. Try flipping it over. Seriously. Why can't we go inside? Just, honey, let me try. Uh, I'm tired. Give me yours. You, you have mine. All right. What? Please, if you Dad, could just... why aren't you opening hey, the honey, door? Can everyone just shut the... Don't go there. Go on a real vacation. Go RVing.